Hello, it's Steve here again from the Studio One Soapbox. And in today's video, it's all about the bass. Now, when it comes to bass guitar, we're normally presented with two main tracks. In this case, on track 19, we have a bass DI, just meaning the direct signal of that bass guitar. And on track 20, we have a bass cabinet, uh, which has been mic'd up. So let's just hear what we're working with. Okay, so you get the idea. So what would be number one on the list when it comes to working with these two tracks? Well, if you decide to use both, uh, the first thing you're going to have to tackle is phase and delay compensation. Now, if we think about it, why would there be an issue here? Well, the base DI is normally plugged straight into a preamp or straight into a console. There's nothing getting in the road of that signal. It's usually fairly clean and that there's nothing at all to get in the road of its round trip. When it comes to the bass cabinet, if you think about it, we have a bass amplifier going to a bass cabinet, the bass cabinet going to a microphone on the front of it or several mics. We also have to tackle the room it's placed in, reflections to and fro in that room. Uh, then we have our preamp, maybe EQ, maybe compression. So as you can tell on a, a mic up bass cabinet, there's a lot of things getting in the road of the round trip of that signal. And so there will always be phase and delay issues between these two tracks. So let's go into our uh, editor and have a look at these two. And if I can zoom in on the start of it here just drag that over bring it down and if we go up here to our time base and choose samples and if you look here you can see that the base di on the top here is definitely starting before our base cabinet so in this case uh, we have a sample difference, as you can see, in the tiny number in the small brackets of about 100, well, we'll just say 195, between maybe 192, 198. So we'll say 195. This is just a, a good rough guess. It's not deadly accurate, but a rough guess of 195 samples of difference between these two tracks when it comes to delay compensation. So how can we sort that out? Well, if we use the number 195, we come down to our sample rate for our project, in this case, 44.1, and we divide our 195 by 44.1 and we have roughly about 4.42 milliseconds there or thereabouts so if we come up to our base di which we now need to delay so that it doesn't sound earlier than the base cabinet below hit our inspector come down to where it says delay type in our 4.42 and that's our delay compensation taken care of. When it comes to phase, as you can see here, um, when the DI is going down, the base cabinet's going down. When it's going up, the base cabinet's going up. And there doesn't seem to be too much of a phase issue here. But one good way to check this out is just to simply throw on the mix tool on one of these tracks and click the little phase on off button and just listen if there's the low end seems to disappear, then you have a bit of an issue and you can decide where to put the phase on or phase off. That's uh, the easiest way to do it manually. So we've now sorted out our phase and our delay compensation. Um, let's just listen to this without the delay compensation. Here we go. Let's add it in. You can hear how that tightens things up. Let's try that again. Let's bring it in. So 
So you can hear how that uh, tightened things up and our low end is definitely working a bit better. These two tracks are now a bit more working in harmony. Now let's take that off and go back to our mixer. So that is our number one port of call is to check our phase and our delay compensation. Here I've shown you how to do it manually. Uh, it works very well. Um, but there are uh, programs that do uh, offer quick ways of doing this. Uh, one of which is SoundRadix Auto Align, which a lot of pros are using nowadays. Um, but it is quite costly. And I have demonstrated here that just using samples and using the mix tool that you can sort out your phase and your delay uh, manually without any due cost uh, with these little tools that uh, come with Studio One. So that's that taken care of. Next up, what we really don't want is these two tracks frequencies overlapping each other because that can cause masking and um, it can have artifacts and no matter how much we uh, sort out our phase and our delay between these two tracks, the relationship between them, there will always be a rub. There will always be slight phase issues no matter what way you do it. It's just the nature of the beast and there's nothing can be done about it. So we can help that by getting the frequencies of one track out of the road of the frequencies of the other. Now the best way to decide on this is usually to take the base DI and put a little high pass, low pass on these two tracks. So let's go for our EQ2, just for handiness. And on our base DI, I'm going to low pass it. And you're heading towards 200 to 250, there or thereabouts. In this case, 226, somewhere in between. So we've low passed our DI. And why would we take all the lower frequencies? The reason being is, the base DI is easier to work with on the low end. There should be zero distortion, it's clean, and there's very little getting in the road of the round trip of that signal. And at the end of the day, those lows, we want them to be solid, uh, thick, and all the lovely things we like about a good low end bass. So then to get the bass cabinet out of the road of the DI, bring that over. In this case, do that one, and we'll high pass that, roll that up to the 225 or thereabouts. And now these two are getting out of each other's road. So the DI is going to take the low ground, and the base cabinet is going to take the high ground. Now let's hear what they both sound like now. Let's take those EQs off. Bring them back in. And really that's all we're doing there. We're trying to get these two tracks to work in harmony with each other. And that's only if you have uh, chosen to use both tracks. In a lot of cases, people will take the bass DI simply duplicate it and create their own bass cabinet because sometimes you may not like the sound of the, the mic'd up bass cabinet and in Pro Tools uh, it is quite shocking but a lot of the times the bass DI is duplicated and they simply use that sound samp uh, plugin that comes with Pro Tools Honestly, the number of uh, guitar tracks and the number of bass tracks that that has taken the place of, um, I think would scare people if they really found out. It's probably the most used plugin in the world, I would say. But we don't have that in uh, Studio One. But we could simply take our uh, bass DI and uh, duplicate that track and then throw on some distortion. Or we could uh, reamp that, or we could put on a VST such as Amplitube or some sort of guitar emulator and create a nice based 
a cabinet sort of thing there and maybe use that because we like it better or it works better for the track, whatever it happens to be. There's always loads of choices and I think that's where confusion can get in. In this case, I'm just going to stick with the base cabinet one that was supplied. Now, when it comes to creating that low end, which we're going for on our base DI. Now we want to solidify that a bit more and the best way to deal with these low ends, which is um, 226 and below, is to throw on a multi-band compressor, simply because we can select that low band. Um, so I'll try a C4, just on mono. And if we bypass all the upper ones, which we don't need, and we roll this up to, I think it was about 2 25 or whatever there we go and we uh, try to get a bit of compression going on here so I'll play this back and work this little compressor in the low end give a little boost of 3 dB and now compress that back down to zero by moving the threshold So there you go, we've got about 3 dB of compression going on there. So we've raised it up about 3 dB and we're crushing it back down to zero. Now let's try that with the compressor off. Add the compressor on. Just tightens things up. And now we've got a good solid low end going on there. Now obviously we can get into EQ and things, um, but I don't want to tell you or direct you to oh, put this EQ on, uh, make this EQ move, because as I've said before, different mixes require different things. There's no set way of doing anything. And even when we're using presets for these things, um, you know, uh, you have no idea what that preset was set on, probably in a, a really good studio with uh, lovely preamps and all sorts, maybe a console going. And, you know, we're sitting at home in our kitchens, in our basements, in our bedrooms, and we're throwing on that preset, maybe designed by some celebrity mixer. And we're thinking, well, that's that sorted. But it doesn't suit your mix because maybe you've recorded that guitar that bass guitar in your bedroom, in your basement, totally different thing. And you don't have all those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment sitting around either. So, you know, you just have to be careful and just think it through what works for your mix rather than what has worked for someone else's. But what I would say is there's maybe two main frequencies that people would always head to. One is a 350 to 400 hertz uh, where you would maybe boost your bass guitar. The reason for this is because three, 300, 350, 400 uh, in your drums is always a, a bit of a muddy area which we normally cut a pocket out of which means that there's a little pocket missing there and that gives us an opportunity to fill that pocket with our bass guitar. And that's why that would be done. It's more to do with the relationship working with the drum kit, which uh, a lot of people hit the three to 300 to four, 400, 450, somewhere in that region. There's always a bad frequencies, which are normally cut. And so this gives you the opportunity, as I say, to fill it with a bass. So you would maybe boost um, 300, 350, 400, your bass guitar. And we also head up from 800 hertz to maybe 1 kilohertz, uh, where we're wanting like the finger noise of the bass, or we're wanting it to poke its head through a little in a mix. And so there would be maybe two main frequencies you could maybe focus on. So that's roughly 350, 400, the low end, give it a little boost. And 800 in the higher 800, 
to a one kilohertz, somewhere about there. Give that a little boost. If you're looking a bit more of that finger action, of that sort of uh, sound of the bass happening to poke through a little. That would be two main frequencies. The rest, you know, it depends on your mix. So there's no point in me saying do this, do that or do the other. But that's two frequencies that maybe you could start off focusing on and then seeing what else would work for your mix. And as you know, uh, bass guitar and the kick drum and the drums themselves work very much in unison. They're or that's what you're aiming for is to get them to work in unison because they're always rubbing against each other especially the kick drum and the bass guitar and as I've said in earlier videos you have to decide who's going to rule that low end because both can't do it uh, you can't have the bass and the kick drum uh, taking that low end one's got to take it and um, once you've decided that for the mix and what suits your mix that helps them with EQ decisions later on so uh, all we've done so far is checked our phase, our delay. We've decided to take our bass DI because it's a nice clean sound. And we're going to use that for our low end. So we have EQ'd and run a nice little low pass on, around about 200 to 250. Then we've solidified that by using a multiband, so we can just compress that same area without affecting the other frequencies. Again, 226. And we're just going for about 3 dB of compression there. Don't want to squash the life out of it and take the dynamics out. And to get this one out of the road, we've used the exact same EQ. I should stress, make sure you use the exact same EQ, whether it be plug-in or external because we don't want to reintroduce any different phase uh, issues which can happen by using a different EQ. So make sure you use the same EQ on both tracks. And as we said, we went up to our 220, 225, and we've rolled off the low end. So we can use this for our high end. Um, so what we could do in our base cabinet we could stick on our 800 uh, boost. So let's come out of that. Another nice EQ. Let's just use the stock EQ. Let's see. Uh, Personas Pro EQ. And what we could do is go for about 800 hertz. Uh, let's use this one. say 800 and give it a little boost and let's hear that take it off that's maybe a bit much And it just helps that sound of the fingers or the higher the neck, a little bit of buzz, a little bit of finger action, which just uh, can help us poke the head through of the mix there and help in an aiding and abetting to get a nice bass sound. Then if we drag that over onto this one, uh, take that off. And what we could do is give that little boost in the 350 section. So if we go here, we'll say 350. And we'll do the same. We'll have a little boost at 350. Let's hear what that sounds like. Take it off. And as I said, what you would do there is take if you've taken 350 out of your drums, then you can add a little bit back in here on your bass guitar to fill that little pocket up. And uh, as you know, it's quite a common thing to do. Anything you notch out of your drums, you kind of try and fill with your bass. Anything you notch out of your bass, you try and kind of fill with your drums. And that's the type of uh, relationship we try to get going there. Um, the only other thing I would say then is that 
these two I have going to a, a bus, as you can see. And what we might want to do is add on a 160. Oh no, 165, yep, there it is. And maybe just throw this on, give it a bit of gentle compression to gel these two together. Take it off. Something like that, possibly. Um, just to give you an idea, throw a compressor on, help gel these two together. You can all use, always use our base as well to uh, give a little bit more boost. Throw our base on the DI. Let's hear what that sounds like. Again, you can knock yourself out with ideas here. Um, as I say, EQ, compression thereafter. But ideally, the main thing here is to get these two to work in harmony. And that is uh, done by our phase, our delay relationship, using a high pass and low pass filters on both tracks. Throwing on a C4 on our DI just to compress that low end and give it a bit more solidness. And uh, we can then uh, maybe boost 800 or 350 because uh, we want to, the 800 to sound a bit more of the buzz, a bit more finger action if we're looking for that. And 350 because we've cut that out of our drums. Um, the only other thing that we could do here Say for instance, we really hated our bass cabinet. So let's just hide that track. Mute that, hide that, we hit you. And let's go for our bass DI. And we'll just duplicate that track complete. So here's our duplicated track. What I'll do is I'll actually take those off. And what we could do now is add a little bit of distortion to that track. And um, what I'll do, which I shouldn't have done there actually, is uh, put on our high pass again, because we don't want it getting in the road of our DI. So around 225. And maybe we could either add on a VST or we might want to add a little distortion. Let's see if I have any distortion plugins here. Um, let's go for Personas. They have a nice wee distorter. There it is, red light distortion. Let's try that. Try some fuzz. That's quite nice. I like that, that's extreme. Bring the output down a bit. Take it out. So there's our low end. Throw in a distorted one. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's hear that in the mix. Sounds quite good. I took that compressor off. Like the same, just offering some ideas for how to deal with a bass DI and an amped bass cabinet. Uh, also, what you could do is use the bass DI, 
use the base cabinet and then maybe throw on a crushed uh, distorted uh, track as well which we create from a duplicate of the DI and blend that in underneath then add a little compressor on a bus then to tie all three tracks together but very little uh, compression because you know bass is dynamic and we want it to be dynamic and we don't want to squash the life out of it the same with our overall mix we really don't want to go mental with our compression and just take all the dynamics out which we'll have to put back in through automation and riding faders and doing it the old school way so i hope these few ideas have helped you to uh, think about how you can get these two tracks to work in unison and how to consider bass guitar the one thing i would say just before i go is if you consider bass guitar frequencies the top e string is 41.2 hertz so bass guitar really does delve right down into the low end that's why on uh, bass guitars it's quite common to throw on a uh, a high pass filter of around 50 hertz uh, just to roll off that low end and remember a high pass if you high pass at 50 hertz uh, you're not cutting everything immediately off there um, you're gently rolling off and lowering the volume right down into lower frequencies uh, so do remember 41.2 hertz is the lowest note on a bass guitar the middle c is 65 hertz and that's why um, we kind of head to the 60 to 80 range then 80 to 120 range then we're up to maybe 200 thereabouts and as i say 350 400 we could give that a little boost if we've cut that out of our drums then we're up into maybe 800 to 1k range um, just where we're looking a bit more buzz, a bit more finger sounds, uh, just to help it cut through or to give it that human element in the bass guitar. So I hope these little ideas help you to consider um, how to work with the bass. Um, it's not a complete um, source material here. There's lots of stuff on the internet. Go looking around and seeing how other different people have utilized bass guitar in their mixes. As I say, Everything is mix dependent and you're just trying to create something that suits the mix you're working on. So thanks for joining me today. I hope you found this a little bit helpful and give a little bit of an insight and happy mixing and I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you.